Okay. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's a joy to meet you again in this fashion. Amen. Yes, this is Wednesday Night Live. We are going Wednesday Night Live. So all Amen. those persons right across the length and breadth of this world, you can tune in and be blessed by what the Lord has prepared for us. Indeed, he has been Amen. using us in a remarkable way to bring honor and glory to his name. So as we come this evening to worship our maker and our king, I pray that the Holy Spirit will impress upon our hearts and may at the end of this service, may we all be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. So welcome one, welcome all, and let us all have a spiritful time with Jesus. Amen. At this time, Elder Robert Morrison will give us the opening prayer. pray divine god and our heavenly father we are indeed happy and we are glad and grateful for this opportunity where we can come and praise and worship you we lift up your name we we lift up your your your, your name in praise and honor and glory and tonight as we have our wednesday night live we ask lord that you will come divinely close to us that you will open our dark understanding and that you will touch the one who you have chosen to bring up life. Pray that you will consecrate him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, that the word that comes from his mouth will bring life and hope and people will see Jesus high and lifted up and be even drawn closer to you. Bless those that are joining us now, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. We're going to night. start our, our song service for this evening. God has been truly good to us throughout today. So we have all mm -hmm. praises that we have to give to him because if it wasn't for him we will not be available to be doing this right now so i have to give him all the praise so the first song we'll be singing is praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer sing our heart is wonderful proclaim Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide his children, in his arms he carried them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness, praise him, praise him ever in joyful song praise him praise him jesus our blessed redeemer for our sins he suffered and bled and died he who rock our hope of eternal salvation hail him hail him jesus the crucified sound his praises Jesus who bore our sorrow, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Heavenly portal, loud with us and a ring. Jesus, Savior, reign it forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming, 
over the world victorious, power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Amen. Hymn 251, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him is always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along a snarl away. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me. A long as far away, he lives, he lives, salvation to him for. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O oh Christian. Lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ our King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind because he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along the star away. He lives, he lives, salvation to him for. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives with me. My heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And because he lives, we know that he is our maker and our king. Hymn number 15. My maker and my king. My maker and my king. To thee my all I owe. Thy sovereign bounty. Is the spring when so my blessings flow? Thy sovereign bounty is the spring when so my blessings flow. The creature of thy hand on the alone I live. My God, thy many fits demands more praise than I can give. 
My God, thy benefits demands more praise than I can give. Lord, what can I impart when all is thine before? Thy love demands a thankful heart, the gift. Alas, how for thy love demands a thankful heart, a gift. Alas, how for oh, let thy grace inspire my soul with strength divine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Let every word and each desire and all my days be thine. Praise the Lord. And because we know that he's our maker and our king, we can sing 183. I will sing. Of Jesus' love, 183. I will sing of Jesus' love, sing of him who first loved me for he left. Bright was above and died on Calvary. I will sing. Of Jesus' love, and let endless fruit my heart shall give. He is thine, that I might live. I will sing it love to me. Oh, the depths of love divine, earth or earth or heaven can never know. All oh, that sin as dark as night can be made as white as snow. I will, I will sing of Jesus' love and his endless breath. My heart shall give me as he has died that I might live. I will sing his love. To me, nothing, nothing good for him has done. How could, how could he such love bestow? Lord, I, Lord, I owe my heart is one. Help me now, my love to show. I will sing of Jesus' love and. Let and my heart shall give he is there that I might live. I will sing his love to me. Thank you for your lovely singing. Until next time, God bless. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He we we'll now have the introduction of the speaker that will be done by Elder Robert Morrison. And the pleasure is all mine to be introducing our speaker for the next couple of minutes. The preacher is a friend and a brother to me. I believe that he esteems the word of God above his necessary food. Amen. He's married. He's married. Um, he has two sons and a man who loves God exceedingly. And that is the only qualification why he's standing in the gap tonight. And so as he allows God to use him, I pray that 
we will join hands and heart to lift him up in prayer so that his words will go far and wide. And those who hear tonight will see Jesus high and lifted up and will be even drawn closer to him. However, before he comes, Sister Reed will do the song of meditation. And then the next voice you'll hear is that of our preacher, Brother Delano Reed. Uh, we'll now have the first season of prayer. We will be praying for our, the personnel that are on the front line, the custom officers, the police soldiers, the doctors, and um, all the other members of the front line who fall in the front line category. Let us pray. Divine God and our Heavenly Father, we Declare tonight that you are the bulwark that never fails on our strong tower. You stepped out on the corridors of nothing and you call everything into being. And so we know that all things are possible with you. You sit high and you look low and you rule in the affairs of men. And even in difficult time, strenuous time, we can call upon you and you can still the storm. And a special way we pray for our frontline members of the country and the world at large, the custom officers, the doctors, the lawyers, the police officers, the soldiers, whoever it is that has to be front and center in the battle. We ask, Lord, that you will come divinely close to them, that you will build a special edge around them, that you will send angels excelling in strength, Lord, to encircle them. We pray that you will go before them, that you will go behind them, that you will hover over them, that you will carry them, and Lord, that you will, you will defend them from the darts of the enemy. But we know, despite the ensuing battle, that the victory is even sweeter. And so this morning, this today we claim by faith the victory for our brethren who are facing dire challenges with this COVID-19. Lord, we pray that you will just continue to be with them, to guide them, to lead them and to protect them. Pray that they will put their entire trust in you and that they will be reminded that they can do all things through you who strengthens us. And so, Heavenly Father, we, 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 we leave everything into your capable hand because you have never lost a battle. And so we have nothing to fear unless we forget how you have led us in the past. So keep them safe now, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before 
how Jesus would come again someday. If back then it seemed so real, then I just can't help but feel how much closer his coming is today. Signs of the time are everywhere, and there's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your head. Redemption, joy at night. War on strive on every hand. And violence fill our land. Still some people doubt he'll come again someday. But the word of God is true. He'll redeem his chosen few. Don't lose hope. Soon Christ Jesus will return signs of the time are everywhere and there's a brand new feeling in the air keep your eyes upon the eastern sun, lift up your head, redemption, joy at night. Signs of the time are everywhere. Oh, when there's a brand new feeling in the air keep your eyes upon the eastern sky lift up your head redemption joy at night lift up your head redemption Joy at Amen, 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 brothers and sisters. Good night to you. I want to thank Sister Reed for that lovely song. And who is my wife? We are here today on another Wednesday night. And God has 
God has laid on my heart a message for his people. Our scripture reading tonight is taken from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. That is Ezekiel chapter 8, reading from verse 12 to 16 and then verse 18. That is Ezekiel chapter 8, reading from verse 12 to 16 and verse 18. I'm just waiting a bit longer for those who would want to get that text. Ezekiel 8, verse 12 to 16, and verse 18. And it says, He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, as thou, not, or the, as, thou, sorry, as thou seen this, O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see great abominations that they do. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. 18 and last said, Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Brethren, when we read this text, it was a warning God was sending to the children of Israel at that time. But when we read Ezekiel chapter 9, because of the warning that God would have sent, these people did not hearken, so to speak, or did not listen to what God wanted them to do. And because of this, God pronounced a judgment on the land of Israel at that time. When we read chapter 9, the Bible said that God sent the angels, angel with the writer's ink on, said he should not spare both old and young, men, women, and even little children. Anyone that the mark of the Lord is not in their foreheads, they should kill them. When we look at it, brethren, we will say that that sound as if God perhaps lost his mind or God was a wicked God. But then the scriptures tells us that God will not destroy a nation or a people unless he send first a warning. And because of that, God sent a warning first and then he act. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your high and holy name. Loving Lord, I am not worthy to talk to your people. So I ask that you forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Hide me behind that old rugged cross. Let not me be seen and heard, but that you'll be seen and heard through me. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to speak to you on the time that I have. Under the caption, is Sunday really holy? Persons will say, yes, it is holy or no, it is holy, but we do not want man's opinion. We would want to know what God says. And because of that, we are going to turn to the word of God and, if possible, through history and let us see if we can understand and un answer this question. The Great Controversy, page 448, the servant of the Lord says, as a sign of the authority of the Catholic Church, papist writers cite the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow off, because by keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the church's power to ordain feasts and to command them on the sin. What then is the change of the Sabbath, but the sign or mark of the authority of the Roman church, the mark of the beast? The Roman church has not relinquished her claim to supremacy. And when the world and the Protestant churches accept a Sabbath of her creating, while they reject the Bible Sabbath, they virtually admit this assumption. They may claim the authority of tradition and of the fathers for the change, but in so doing, they ignore the very principle 
which separates them from Rome. The Bible and the Bible only is the religion of Protestants. Those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists, we understand that when we look, our church has five great pillars of the Reformation. And the first one is Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. In St. John 17, verse 17, the Bible says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. When we read Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 27, Jesus was talking to two of his disciples from Jerusalem, from Emmaus and to Jerusalem. And Jesus disguised himself in such a way that these two men did not know him. Eventually, Jesus revealed himself. And the Bible said, he began, he began to teach them from the Psalms and the Proverbs and the, and the writings of Moses, the things concerning himself. So Jesus wanted these men to understand that his resurrection and all that transpired after it was prophesied, was something that was told to them before. And when Jesus wanted wanted them to understand, Jesus went to the Bible for them to understand exactly what he was saying. Then we have solo gratia, grace alone. Solo Christus, by Christ alone. Solo fide, by faith alone. Solo de, solo de gloria, by giving glory to God. In St. Matthew chapter 15, verse says 7 to 9, we read, St. Matthew 15. St. Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 to 9. The Bible says, He hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth, and, and, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teachings for doctrines, the commandments of men. So Jesus is here saying that these men, the Jews at that time, instead of listening to what the scripture says, instead of obeying the word of God, they turned to tradition. Could it be then, brethren, that we are actually accepting man's tradition today in the place of God? Could it be that we are worshiping on a day which was created by man and not God? But we don't want to jump to any conclusions. We don't want to have our own opinion when it comes to this. We want to know exactly what God says. The story has been told, brethren, of one of the Caesars of Russia. It is said that this Caesar was walking in his park one day, and he came upon a sentry standing before a patch of weeds. The Caesar asked him what he was doing there. The sentry did not know. All he could say was that, he had been ordered to his post of duty by the captain of the guard. The Caesar then sent his aid to ask the captain of the guard, but the captain could, could not say, could not, sorry, the captain could, could only say that the regulations had called for a sentry at that particular spot. His curiosity had been aroused. The Caesar ordered an investigation, but no living man at the time could remember the time when there had not been a sentry at that post. And none could say why he was there or what he was or what he was or what he was guarding. But sometime after it was revealed to the Caesar what was actually taking place. Finally, brethren, the archives were open. And after a long and after a long search, the mystery was solved. The records revealed, the records showed that Catherine the Great had once planted a rose bush in that plot of ground and a sentry had been put there to see that no one trampled upon it. The rose bush had, had died. That rose bush had died, brethren, but no one thought to cancel the order. And so, and so for many years, the spot where the rose bush had, had once been was watched by men who did not know what they were watching. It became a tradition. They really did not know why they were there. They just know that they had to be there. So it is today, church, when we have many religious te teachers standing, 
guard over doctrines and practices, the origin of which they do not know, and they are certainly not rooted in the scriptures, simple a tradition. They think they are guarding some sacred plant of truth, when in reality they are standing guard over some weed of error. And so it is, persons are worshiping on a day in which they cannot find any scriptural authority for why they are worship on, worshiping on this particular, particular day. In St. Matthew 15, 13, the Bible says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Every religious doctrine, brethren, which is not rooted in the Holy Scriptures, will be destroyed. And if you want to stand among the victorious ones in the end of time, anchor your faith in the doctrines and practices that God himself has planted. We are told in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, for the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy, ser nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And this and all other commands must be obeyed. All Christians everywhere testify to the necessity of abiding by the principles of these divine commands of God. All are equally important. In James chapter 2, verse 10 to 12, James said, if you offend in one, you are guilty of all. So in essence, brethren, if I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and the only commandment I'm keeping is the fourth commandment that says we must remember and keep the Sabbath day holy, then I'm guilty of breaking all. And if I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist, I go to church on another day, and I'm only keeping all the other commandments except the one that God says to remember the Sabbath. I am guilty of all. Because we are told in Malachi 3 verse 6, God says, for I am the Lord, I change not. So God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. God is a God that will not change. Mankind will change. Mankind will change their minds. But God says what he means, and he means what he says. And, and, and persons will want us to believe that the Holy Spirit lead them to believe a particular issue. But my friends, the Holy, the Holy Spirit will not lead us to disobey the express command of God. The Holy Spirit will not lead us to disobey the word of God. Jesus said that he, he magnifies his word even above his very name. So if we are going to be, 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 if we are going to be soldiers in the Lord's army, brethren, we have to follow what God says and do what he requires of us. In the Great Controversy, page 596, paragraph 3, the servant of the Lord says, Notwithstanding, the Bible is full of warnings against false teachers. Many are ready thus to commit the keeping of their souls to the clergy. There are today thousands of professors of religion who can give no other reason for points of faith which they, which they hold than that they were so instructed by their religious leaders. They pass by the Savior's teachings almost unnoticed and place implicit confidence in the words of the minister. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 7, it says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Brethren, what am I saying? I am saying, brethren, that whatever we believe as Christians, especially as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, it must be grounded in the word of God. Whatever we hold dear as, uh, as our religious faith, it must be rooted in the Holy Scriptures. We are studying this week, uh, uh, in this quarterly, as a matter of fact, about how to interpret Scriptures. We, we were once known as people of the book. But, but, but as, uh, as decades pass for us, uh, uh, and as society changes, persons who were once people of the book are looking elsewhere. The smallest child in the Seventh-day Adventist church at one point could, could, could tell you the Ten Commandments from memory. They could tell you perhaps the 20th fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist church from memory. 
And today it is not so. What's the problem? The problem is, brethren, we are getting our priorities twisted. We are, we, we are majoring in the minor and minor in the major. We are, we are majoring in the minor region and not standing for God and doing what God requires of us. And so as we remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, we must remember also which day the Lord set apart as his holy day. That was the seventh day of the, of the week or Saturday as we know it. Today, but in Revelation 1 verse 10, the Bible says, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet. Now, brethren, persons will want us to believe that the Lord's day is the first day of the week. And unless you can show someone that the Lord's day is not the first day of the week, you have to acknowledge and believe and go by what they are saying if you cannot show them from the scriptures what day is the Lord's day. Because what we are saying, church, we are not trying to use man's opinion. We are not trying to use what man believes. We are trying to say what God requires. So we are turning now. I'm reading from Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 27 and 28. And the Bible says, not brother read, but the Bible says, And he said unto me, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath day. So brethren, the Bible shows us what day is the Lord's day, and the Lord's day is the Sabbath day. This commandment, the Sabbath, goes right back to creation. In Genesis 2, 1 to 3, God said that he, he created everything. And on the seventh day, God, God rested. He, he finished creation week on the sixth day, and he rested on the seventh. But then, why did God rest? Was it because God was tired? Was it because God was doing so much work that he had to take a break? And the question is, no, brethren. Because when we read in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, the Bible said, The Lord thy God fainted not, neither is weary. So in essence then, God rested on the seventh day for us to understand that he had sanctified and blessed this particular day. And as persons who are following him must do likewise. So in essence, brethren, if the Lord's day is a Sabbath day, why are we having so much confusion in the world today? There are some who think that the teaching of the seventh day is something new, but in actuality, it is the oldest institution known to man because it dates back to creation week, just as does the institution of marriage. So brethren, if we need marriage, and when I say marriage, you all know what we are talking about. We are not talking about the new age marriage that they are coming with now. We are talking about marriage as God established it in the Garden of Eden between a man and a woman. So if we still, if, if, if as a man you still need a woman as your wife, then in essence you still need the Sabbath. The Sabbath then becomes a memorial of creation, a sign or a symbol of the great creative power of God. We must follow Jesus' example when he says, when it says in Luke 4 verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus, whilst he, were, he, whilst he was here, he went to church on Sabbath. He honored the Sabbath day. He kept the commandments of God. But we are told by some brethren that you don't, you don't know what day, which day is the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day can be Sunday. It can be Wednesday. It can be Friday. Or it can be Tuesday. Another person looked at me and said, yes, brother, read but." You must take one day in seven to rest. So if I rest on Tuesday, Tuesday is my Sabbath. And I said, you're right. Tuesday is your Sabbath, but not the Sabbath of the Lord. So the seven days, not the seven day based on how I check it. The seven days, the seven day based on how God ordained it. In St. John 15, verse 10, the Bible says, If he keep my commandments, he shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. St. John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. St. Matthew 15, verse 9, I will read that already. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. The first day of the week, our Sunday keeping, stands today only upon the traditions of men. Because a lot of persons will say that 
people say their pastor explained it to them and, and told them that the first day is a Sabbath day. But even though our pastors are there to guide us, elders are there to guide us, deacons are there to guide us, our, brother, our church brothers and sisters are there to gui gui guide us, our instructions must come from the word of God. And we must be like the Berians. In Acts 17, verse 11, the Bible says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Ephesians 5, verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 5, verse 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things come at the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Ephesians 4, verse 14 says, That, he, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21 says, Prove all things, all fast with that which is good. 1 John 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, brethren, because we are saying, if we are saying that we are people of the book, we must understand what God teaches in whatever thing we hold dear to our hearts and follow what God says and not what we believe. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on to fables. So God is saying, brethren, in the latter time, persons will depart from the faith. The Great Controversy, page 597. The servant and the Lord, the inspired writer said, But our ministers infallible. How can we trust our souls to their guidance unless we know from God's word that they are light bearers? A lack of moral courage to step aside from the beaten track of the world leads many to follow in the steps of learned men. And by their reluctance to investigate for themselves, they are becoming hopeless, hopelessly fastened in the chains of error. Brethren, when, when I read that, I was saying that that quote from Sister White sound harsh because how oh, oh, can, can the servant and the Lord say that the ministers are infallible? How oh, can the servant and the Lord say mankind will feel, how oh, can she say that a person who will stand in the pulpit of the living God will tell us error or lead us to believe things that are not biblical? But brethren, I had to agree with what she's saying not only because she said it but when i turn to second corinthians chapter 11 and i will repeat myself second corinthians chapter 11 verse 13 to 15 the bible says for such are false apostles deceit, deceitful workers transforming themselves in their in transforming themselves in the apostles of christ and no more before Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers trans, trans, also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Sister White says the ministers, ministers can be ministers are not infallible. The Bible says Satan can use ministers. To, who, who is working for him and uh, to teach us if they are working for Christ. So in essence, the servant and the Lord is not wrong. So we cannot go by what the minister says. We cannot go by what the elder says. We cannot go by what the deacon says unless we know from God's word that they are say, say, telling the truth. And I'm, and, and, and I'm not saying, brethren, that we should not listen to our pastors. I'm not saying we should not listen to our elders. I'm not saying we should not listen to 
or deacons, but I'm saying whatever our pastors, elders, and deacons say, we can only go along with what they are saying if it is grounded in the word of God. She goes on to say then, church, they see that the truth for this time is plainly brought to view in the Bible, and they feel the power of the Holy Spirit attending to its proclamations. Yet they will follow the opposition of the clergy to turn them from the light. To, though reason and conscience are convinced, these deluded souls dare not think different from the minister. And their individual judgment, their eternal interests are sacrificed to the unbelief, the pride, and the prejudice of another. Ezekiel 22 verse 26 says, The priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the unholy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And I've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profane among them. But persons are saying that the apostles, Peter and John and Paul and all these persons, they changed the Sabbath day. So because they have changed that day, today we have a new Sabbath, which is the first day of the week. But then I can only go along with what they are saying, brethren, if it is justified by the word of God. In Acts 16, verse 13, the Bible says, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and, and, spake to, and spake unto the women which rested there, which resorted there. Acts 17, verse 2 says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in, went in unto them on three Sabbath days and reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Acts 18 verse 4 says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and, and pro, uh, persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 13 verse 14, 42 and 44 actually saying the same thing. So we are seeing from these words then, brethren, that the apostles kept the Sabbath. So if the apostles kept the Sabbath, if Jesus kept the Sabbath, how is it then we are told that the Sabbath is changed? But changed by who? No, there is no record anywhere in the New Testament indicating that the disciples or followers of Jesus honored any other day as a sacred Sabbath of the Lord. Paul, like all the apostles, continued in the footsteps of Jesus in obedience to the commandments of God. Brethren, there are eight texts in the New Testament with men, which mentions the first day of the week. If there was to be a change from the first day to the seventh day of the week, it should, have to, it should have to be mentioned in one of these eight texts. But for the interest of time, brethren, I'm not going to go through the eight, these eight texts. Instead, I'm going to cover just a few verses to make my point here. And I'm turning to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 23. And I'm going to read from verse 52 to 54. Luke 23, verse 52 to 54. Luke chapter 23. Because as we are saying, brethren, we want to know what God's word says and not what we believe. Luke chapter 23, verse 52 to 54 says, This man, talking about Joseph, went on to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulchre, a tomb that was hewn in stone, wherein never, never man before was laid. So they put Jesus into a new tomb. And we can understand that this is a fulfillment of prophecy when we read, um, when we read Isaiah 53, that they, they laid him in a tomb where never before a man was laid. But we're not going, going, going there. We're not, we don't want to go into that part of the prophecy. Verse 54 says, and that day was a preparation day, and the Sabbath drew on, full stop. So they took Jesus down from the tomb, and they took Jesus down from the cross, and they laid him into a new tomb, in, into a new, new grave then. And the Bible said that day was a preparation day. So, I don't see Friday here, or I don't see Saturday here, or Sunday, or Monday, or Tuesday. But the Bible says preparation day. But then, this month, we put a particular name on a particular Friday. And we call that Friday Good Friday. 
And the reason why we call it Good Friday, we are saying that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. And I'm not denying that. But then my Bible did not say Friday. It said preparation day. So if the, then it says here in verse 55, and the woman also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. And verse 56 says, And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So these women prepared spices and ointments and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So these are pers these women were following Jesus. And they put him into the tomb and the Bible said it was a preparation day. But we say Good Friday. Then the Bible said that they rested according to the commandment. Now, I am not as bright as some of you guys are. But the only commandment I can recall that Jesus, that, that says we are to rest on a particular day was the Sabbath commandment. You understand? It was a Sabbath commandment. But then when you read verse 24, verse 1, it says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and certain others with them. So the Bible says you have Good Friday. Then the Bible talk about, they, they talk about preparation, they were called Good Friday. Then it says that they rested according to the commandment, which is the Saturday. Then they say that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised. So three consecutive days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but persons are saying they do not know what day is a Sabbath day. Brethren, I'm wrapping up now, but I could go further, but in the interest of time, I'm going to break here. What I'm trying to say then, brethren, the sub Sunday cannot be holy because it was a day, and if I had gone down further in, in, in the word, we will see that Sunday was a day that was given to us by man and not by God. So if we are going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we have to follow Jesus Christ through his word. And let us understand what is coming. Because before I come off here, we are, we are in a pandemic now. This COVID-19. And look at it, brethren. The state, the government, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the government is wrong. The government are saying that we should do certain things to protect ourselves. And say that we should stay in. And it is a global event. Could it be? That when this National Sunday law will pass, it will be a global event where everybody will have to obey or suffer death or imprisonment. So these are my few words, brethren. And let us hold dear to the word of God. And then over to brother. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, brother Reed, for those words. At this time, we will have our final season of prayer, which will be done by Brother James. And Brother James will be praying for those prayer requests that are, that are coming in on the WhatsApp line and for those oh. prayer requests that are placed in the box at church and for those that are sick. So at this time, Brother James will take us to the throne of grace. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Eternal, holy, divine God. Indeed, O oh Father, we are grateful, O oh God, and thankful for this opportunity, dear God, that we are alive. It's by your grace and your mercy, O oh God, while we are not consumed, O oh God, by the enemy. But Lord, you are the one in control. So Lord, we lift up your holy name tonight. We worship Lord before you, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, for the privilege of worship. Lord, you make provision that we can come before your presence in this format, Lord God, to lift up your holy name, regard less of the thing that is happening around us. And we say thank you, Father. And so, Lord, as we come tonight, we thank you for your word. Your words, oh God, of encouragement. 
We thank you, O God, for your man's servant. May you continue to bless him and his family to keep them safe also. And may the word, O God, that presented tonight, dear Father, find fertile place in our hearts and we will repent and surrender all to you, O God. O Lord, this time I present before you all the requests that come through, O God, the WhatsApp line. O Lord, there are many, but Lord, you know them. So Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus tonight, Lord God, that you will go through and look, O God, on every request of your people. O God, I know it's a time, O God, a pandemic. But you, Lord, is the one that is in charge. Take away fear from us, O God, and help us to understand, O God, that you promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us, O God. So, Lord, I pray tonight, right now, that you will just go through and answer according to your will. And then, Lord, I pray, O God, for the request in the prayer box at church. Oh, Father God, I ask that you will just touch them. Go through, dear Father, and read them, Lord. I know, dear God, that your children are hurting in many, many different ways, dear Father. But I pray, Lord, that you will bring comfort, bring hope, help them to understand, oh God, Again, that you is in charge. Help your children to fix their eyes on you, Father, and to be faithful no matter what, oh, Father God. And so, Lord, I ask that you will be with the members of our churches. Father, even though we cannot congregate the way we are to, or we generally does. Merciful Father, help them to examine, help us to examine our lives, O oh God, that it is well with you, Father. Help us to remember the ten virgins. Help us to remember the oil, O oh God, the Holy Spirit. Lord, tonight as I come, it's a burden on my heart, oh God, because I know that the hour is late and Jesus is even at the door. May you help us, dear God, not only to fix our eyes on the pandemic, but to fix our eyes on you, dear Father. And so, Lord, I present, oh God, your people who are sick. Oh Lord, I know many different sicknesses. But there's a bomb in Gilead, oh God, and you are the physician there. You have never lost a case, oh God. So tonight I pray that you will have mercy upon your children. And I pray, dear God, that you will bring healing, God. Relieve some of the burdens and pains from your children. Give them a testimony, dear God, that they too will share the awesome power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, as I come, I ask, Father, that you will help me to be the priest of my home, the person, the mandate of God in which you have given to me, God. If I have failed you, forgive me, God, I pray. But even now, I cover my wife and my children. I cover my community, dear God. I cover the Jamaica, a land we love. And leave the world at large, oh God, who are going through anarchy right now, God. I pray that you will stretch forth your hands, oh God. You are the one, oh Father, that is in charge. So, Father, I pray tonight that you love mercy upon us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. We have, amen. Thank you very much, my brother. Amen. 
we give God thanks and praise for using us tonight. We give God thanks and praise for using us tonight to bring honor and glory to his name. Amen. I do hope and trust that as we go through the rest of this week, may we continue to tell others about the love of Jesus. Amen. 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 Our brother Alex, I'm going to ask that you, after we have signed off, to just let us remain on for a little while. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.